Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first reading of our 23rd Annual National Poetry Month reading series. We have a lot of great poetry ahead of us this month, and while we aren't in the store together this year, we do feel lucky that we have so many talented readers who will be joining us. Today, we welcome David Lee, whose new collection, Rusty Barbed Wire from Samara Press, was just published yesterday and is available in the store now. To get us into the real swing of things, I'd like to introduce our host for all Poetry Month proceedings, our friend, Sean Griffin. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Sundance, for supporting us for 23 years. This has been a great tradition. Um, we're thrilled to, to be able to do it again. I know we're not together in person, but we're together in spirit, and that's what matters. We're going to start this month off, as Emily mentioned, with two wonderful poets, uh, Gail Marie Palmire, our newest um, Nevada poet laureate. Uh, she'll introduce Dave Lee, friend to many in this region. Um, the book, as uh, Emily shared with you, has just been published. It's a marvelous book. Uh, I, I, I've carried it with me wherever I've gone since I've read it. Um, next week, uh, this, this uh, April 13th, we'll be having Irene Ayala, George Peralt, and Courtney Clifton read from uh, their works uh, uh, a week from today. I'm thrilled that we can do this again. Um, I know it's been hard with COVID, but um, the poetry spirit keeps moving on, and I'm not going to take up any more time and say welcome to everybody, and especially to my two dear friends, Gail Marie and Dave. Thank you, Sean. Um, I want to add my voice to the um, thankful voices, um, because without Sundance Bookstore and Sean Griffin um, supporting in such a significant and dramatic way, the literary community in Northern Nevada and our region, our lives would be so, so much thinner. And I really cannot imagine a world um, without both of you. So I am so honored to be here today with you all to kick off this uh, year's um, reading with Dave Lee. Um, I also wanna shout out to Stephen Nightingale and everyone associated with Samara Press. Your vision of and commitment to excellence is evident in this first truly outstanding offering from your new press. Who best to inaugurate a new press with a new book, one of beauty, and substance, enter David Lee. You've all read a bit of the publicity and probably know something about David's esteemed background. First Poet Laureate of Utah, finalist for US Poet Laureate, NEA and NEH fellowships recipient, winner of the Western States Book Award, author of at least a couple dozen books, teacher extraordinaire and a hog farmer. There's much to celebrate in a life so vibrantly lived and this new book, Rusty Barbed Wire, is a testament to that. Dave's work is unlike anything being rendered by other prominent voices. He takes us on journeys that begin with heart and faith. He troubles the waters considerably with acute irony and humor, introduces us to unforgettable characters in all their sublime vulnerabilities, and somehow gets us back to where we started, a place where love and hope abide. If it's the job of the poet to transport us to where we need to be, Dave does this and more. He takes us to places we couldn't ever have imagined, offers us both mirrors and windows into the glorious nuances of simply being alive in an absurd world. And he does this with diction that is both conversational and celestial. Is that hard to imagine? Uh, you bet. 
And that's another reason you really need to read right, this new collection. Its sanctuary of language is so resplendent that you'll be hard pressed not to feel saved. If this is your first encounter with Dave's work, I tell y'all, you better buckle up. If you're already a devotee, you'll be delighted to find some of your favorite poems here in voices you have known and adored. There's Modine, there's E.U. Washburn, there's Clovis Ledbitter. I say thanks be to David Lee and many thanks again to Samara Press for bringing forth this most sacred gift. Please join me in welcoming my dear, dear friend, the amazing David Lee. Wow. Well, my lady, you broke me down. It's gonna take me a <clears throat> minute to regather. Bless you, thank you, I love you. And Sean, same goes for you, brother. Amazing that some of my closest friends on the planet are on this screen right here. And then just in the outside room is, well, the other one, uh, where do I go? I want to begin by uh, saying again, thanks to you two for the introduction. Thanks to Sundance Books. Thanks to my mentor for helping me learn how to use this program all day today. I have occupied her. I want to do a shout out to the uh, staff. At, uh, the, at, at Samara Press, Steve Nightingale. Uh, this was his dream. And what he wanted to do was make the most beautiful books on the planet. And the motto wanted to be, no one will ever pick up a Samara book and say, don't judge this book by its cover. Well, and then his assistant editor, uh, Elizabeth Dilley, and then our wonderful friend, Christine Kelly, uh, from Sundance Books is a part of that organization. And then a fellow that uh, is quite likely, if not the outstanding book designer in the world, he's certainly in the final running for it, Bob Blessy, who, who put this thing together and, and uh, just did a marvelous job on it. I, I could not be more pleased with the book than I am with this. It's a retrospective. It's my Lifetime Achievement Award. It's got 50 years inside it. Now, Jan always tells me when I get ready to do a reading, there's two pieces of instruction. Check, check your flock while I'm low enough. I don't have to worry there. Then she says, don't talk so much between the poems. They're not dull. Okay, I'll try to, to, try to stay with the book and give you a bit of a retrospective. I'll go back 50 years to start off. This is a poem that I was I wrote the rough draft of 50 years ago. This spring, it's called Behold, and I present it to you as a gift from Sandro Botticelli to me, to you, because I was thinking of his Birth of Venus, one of my all-time favorite paintings in the world when I started the poem. And then it became, of course, as all writers know, something totally different and unexpected, and that's why we write, to find that. Behold, and came forth like Venus from an ocean of heat waves. Morning in his pockets and the buckets in his hand, he emerged from the gray shed. Tobacco and wind perched together in song from his tight lips. He gathered day and went out to cast his wheat before swine. And in his mind, he sang songs and thought thoughts, images of clay and heat, wind and sweat, dreams of silver and visions of green earth twisting the cups of his mind. He crossed his fence of rusty barbed wire, the South Utah steps bending the air into corners of sky. He entered the yard to feed his pigs and they come. Well, that's from a book I uh, published in 1978, The Porcine Canticles. My first five books 
all had the same subject matter. Uh, Jan and I had a small farm. We raised pigs. We had up to under, up to 208 head of the animals. And we took it quite seriously in our own way. And that became my subject matter for those early books. I'd like to introduce you to a voice now. My big brother, hero of that time, who became my voice, John Sims. He was a full generation older than me. We hung out and he inhabits these poems. So you get an introduction to the kind of poems I write with this long poem. It's an eight part poem and John and his voice. This poem has an epigraph that is actually the first poem I ever wrote. I was in grade school and my teacher, Miss Carpenter, may God rest her soul wherever it might be. But she sent us to, as we say in civilized parts of the world, the library where there were stacks of books and we got to look through those books and find a poem that we liked and copy that poem down and take it home and then find something in there that you can build on and you write a poem like that out of that poem and that's your homework. And so I wrote the epigraph for this poem. Hell hath no fury like a sow with pigs. And I turned it in to Miss Carpenter and she gave it back to me the next day with an F. And she said, you failed because it's not a poem. It doesn't rhyme, but you can rewrite it and I will change your grade. And I have remained delighted to this very day. I didn't, I took the F. This poem is called Mean. Hell hath no fury like a sow with pigs. Pretty soon now, I said, John nods his head, watching. So I said, I see she's broken the sack. There's water. His head goes up and down again, but he doesn't say anything. So we both stand and watch John's white sow back in her shed while she breathes easy. 700 pounds sprawled across yellow straw. Finally, John says, anytime now. I nod my head this time. He said, yep, just any time. But the only thing we can do is watch. So we stand and wait and watch John's white sow labor. John lights a cigarette to help the time go by while we watch. Last time, said John, she went crazy in hell. I put her in that pen with a wood floor, put in a lamp for the cold. She's half done, got up. That mean son of a bitch, she went over and bit that electric war. It shocked her or something. She went like a crazy woman to bang in her head on the walls and floor, hollered like an elephant shot in the butt with buckshot and tore hell out of that pen and had two more pigs while she's standing up. Never knew, acted like she was blind and couldn't see nothing. I had to get them pigs out with a rake or she would have stomped on them. She jerked that rake right out of my hand and I had to get it back with a stick so as I could get them pigs out or they'd be dead. I got all but one that she killed. She finally went over and laying down but every time one them I had out squoted, she'd jump up and go crazy again. I had to put them in the front of my pickup all night to make her be still. And that light never did work right after that. She burnt it. So I says, how come you keep her, John? She's too big, me. John looked at me like I was crazy or something. 
He said, because she had 12 pigs and raised all but one more besides the one she stomped on. That's why, wouldn't you? I didn't say anything. John's white sow was too mean for me. I would have sold her to John if she was mine, but she wasn't. She was already John's, so I didn't have to. John, I says after a while, because she wouldn't pig. I bet that sow's got a pig stuck breech and it won't come. But John, looks over at his pickup, doesn't say anything. So I say, now, of course, if it does, it doesn't come, it could kill her and all them pigs too, don't you think? But he keeps looking at his pickup. So I say, now, I, I don't know, of course, that might not be it. She'd been in labor a long time. She broke her water before I came. I saw the last of the wet when I came. I, I, no, I don't know. She's not my sow. Might not be that. But John said real low. She throwed Carl out of the pen the time he got in. Tried to climb out after him. She'd have killed him if she'd have got to him. So I decided I wouldn't say anything else. She was John's sow. He didn't know what to do. Why don't you get in there and look, says John. You know more about that than I do. I said, no, I don't, John. And I have to be getting home pretty soon. Jan will be getting worried, and I hate to keep her up. John says, Dave, I'll give you $25 if you go in there and get that pig out. And I said, John, I'm not getting in that pen with that sow for $100. John says, well, okay, $15 cash. I said, no, John. I'm not going to get in there for a thousand dollars. John says, I'll give you a pig. And I said, no, sir, not for all your pigs loaded up to take to the auction. John says, okay, a live pig and you can pick it. But I said, no, and I'm in it. Not for all his pigs. I acted like I was getting ready to leave. I wasn't. I wanted to see how it came out, but I wasn't getting in that pen. So John got damned me and said I was a sissy. And I didn't say anything because John, he was right. John, I says, John says, if I get in there, will you come and hold the lantern in the door so I can see? And I said, yes, because the sow was in bad shape by then. We could see that. And she had to have help. But I said, John, if she comes after me, I'm getting out. And I'm not going to worry about the lantern getting busted with me. So you just better let me out of the way. And John says, she gets up, you just make sure you don't get in my way. Or she's going to get you and that lantern both. And I said, okay, because I know there is no way John can get out of that pen before me. I wasn't worried about that. So I said, where's the lantern? John says, over here. So we go to his pickup for the lantern. And John gives me the lantern and some clean rags to hold. Then he gets in his jockey box and pulls out a pistol. I says, what's that? John says, it's a gun. I says, oh, I see. And he says, I ain't getting in there with her without no gun. And if I need this, I want to have it. My mama didn't raise no idiots. That's why. And he put it in his pocket. And I didn't say anything. She was John Sal, not mine.
John climbed in the pen and I followed. He went in the shed with the sow, but I stayed in the door while he moved around behind her to see what she'd do. She had her eyes closed and breathed hard because she hurt so bad. And I shined a light in so John could see. John knelt down behind her and touched her. She didn't move, so he rolled up his sleeve and started in to see what was wrong. Reach, I whispered. He nodded, so I was right. And John went in to try and get it out. John whispers, hold still, I can't see. I says, who? And he says, you. And I saw the lantern was shaking. I was scared. So I held it with both hands and it was still. John twisted his hand inside the sow and he said, I got it. I'm gonna take it out now. He started pulling his arm back and the pig came out and it was breach. Got it, I says. John says, yeah, give me a rag. And I leaned in to hand him a towel and the pig wiggled in his hand. John tried to grab its mouth, but the pig squealed in his hand. God damn you! John screamed a white sound, jumped up and bellowed so loud the tin roof on the shed shook and jerked around toward John. I stood there like Lot's wife shining the light in. John screams, God damn you again! jumps back against the back wall of the shed and hits it so hard it should have come down, holding the pig tight against his chest. The sow roars at him, the muscles on her body standing out, all the hair on her back straight up. And I think, drop that pig, but I can't say anything. I'm frozen holding the lantern in the door, the sow roaring and John screaming. Then he tears at his pocket and pulls out the pistol. God damn you, he yells, you get away from me, you son of a bitch. That sow barks loud, like a mad dog the size of a Jersey cow. John points the pistol at her head and it shakes like an aspen limb in springtime. God damn you, and she screams again. Snick, 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 snick. I see the empty cylinder turn as John pulls the trigger. I taste powder in my mouth. Drop it, I hear somebody say. John keeps pulling the trigger, yelling, God damn you. The sow roars and her shoulders bunch up in a knot. She's so mad, she's slobbering. Drop it, I yell again. And John looks at me, his eyes wide as hubcaps. Drop that pig, I scream. And I see John's hand loosen and the pig falls to the ground but he keeps pulling that trigger, stick, snick, snick. The pig hits on its back, lies there, and the sow lowers her head and looks at it, but keeps on running, mean, fast, loud. John stops pulling the trigger, but keeps the pistol pointed at her head. And the pig gets up and starts moving and the sow stops grunting and sniffs it and looks at John and barks again. John pulls the trigger again, but he can't say anything anymore. And the sow turns and lies down and grunts. And another pig pops out, shakes its head, tries to clear its note. 
John stands with the pistol pointed with the sow. I stand holding the lantern and the sow grunts to her pigs just like we're not there and nothing happened. And I say, John, and John points the pistol at me. I say, get out, John. And he says, where? And I say, get out of the shed, John, before she gets up. And John says, who? And I say, get out of there, John. And John looks at the sow and points the pistol at her. And he starts sliding around the wall. We get out of John's mean black sow's pen. John's shaking so hard he can't light a cigarette, but drops it on the floorboard. And I pick it up and put it in his mouth. And he smokes. I say, you got a beer? He says, in the back, I think. So I take a lantern and look. He has some hidden junk in the bed. I get it. For a long time, we drink beer. Don't say anything. I see my hands are shaking. So the beer foams out the top of my can. So I drink three fast, so it won't. And I don't know if he ever finished his. Finally, I said, John. I wouldn't have a pig like that. I'd get rid of her if she's mine. She's just too mean. She's going to kill somebody someday. John staring straight ahead through the window. The muscles in his face still tight, drawn. He says, God damn it. That's too bad. I said, well, you can't help it. Some go mean. He says, but she was a good sow. I says, she's okay now. John says, but it was her or me. And I says, it's okay, John. He sips his beer and sets it on the dashboard. He leans back and I see tears in his eyes and he's still staring straight ahead through the windshield. She was a good sow, he says, even if she was mean. God damn it. Hated having to shoot her like that. And I looked out the window, didn't say anything. She was John Sal, not mine. Well, that's one of the pig poems from that part of my life, that phase. That's uh, from um, the Porcine Canticles, 1984. I want to move ahead. Let's see. I'm going to jump that one and go to 1996. Where's this now? All right. Had a, a key moment in my life. My uh, adopted big brother and next Jan best friend, Bill Clefcorn, hit me up and said, How would you like to write a book together? I had no clue what he was asking, didn't know what to do, anything. I, I didn't answer. He asked me a second time, and I thought, well, hmm, 
must be sin. And then he asked me a third time, and I thought, that's the charm. Okay, one way or the other. Yes, yes, I, I could probably learn a lot from that old boy since he was my muse and hero and role model in so many ways. And so we started this book, and he chose this title for it. He said it's going to be called Covenants. And I know that he knew because of my theological background, and he had sort of the same background he had turned from. Uh, I, I, I know he was expecting some sort of covenanting Abrahamic book from me. Uh, I loved the writing of that book. It was the first of three books we did together. We got addicted. We were planning a fourth when he decided the best way out was to go into the other world and leave me holding the bag. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Cliff. But anyway, the three we did were just a lot of fun. In this book, I discovered a new voice. Uh, I, had, I used the John's voice through five books, the, the, the pig poem books. This one was a break. And in this book, I discovered a character, E. U. Washburn. Uh, and he, he, he's based on a fellow, S.K. Hardaway that I, uh, he, he was the catcher on the Blue Stars baseball team I played on and I love that guy, but I call him E.U. Washburn in this. And this is his story, Uncle Abe. And it has an epigraph from Richard Shelton that's also based on an epigraph that I know many of you already know about, the, you know, a line and a hammock on William Duffy's farm in Pine Island, okay, where he says, wasted my life. Clef, uh, Richard Shelton says, I have not wasted my life. So that's the epigraph to work with here. E.U. Washburn's story, Uncle A. Wherever you are, Bill, this one's for you. Once, when I was a boy, walking man come to town twice every year. Folks didn't know who he was. Name him, Uncle Abe. Said he was lost and wandering in his own mind. Harmless old thing, just passing by. Carried this paper bag in his hand. No child nor cat cannot find out what's in. I sidled him in the gravel road, says, Mr. Man, what you got in that paper sack? He turned round, looked me up and down like a rooster hypnotized by a line in the sand. Said, Master Boy, I'll tell you what I brought, but you answer me first one thing. You say, how many years your mama got? I told, he said, hmm. No, no. Tell me, your grandmama home. I said, well, she ain't. She's dead and gone. He said, I was almost a whole live grown up boy once like you, walking along soon. Had me a paper sack of store-bought candy going down the road after work at the cotton gin. Girl, child, woman, on her porch, call me, say, Mr. Man, what you got in that possible sack? Come here, you show me right now, padded beside her, where for me to sit. I come to her, she say, what you bring? I shook all over. She was as beautiful as church house sin. And I felt as ugly as the real thing. She eat peace without asking. I know deep in my paper sack, it was one chocolate covenant hiding to be last. Pretty soon, we almost racing, eating that candy so fast, she lay one smiling piece on her tongue with her finger, she say, 
near. Put her mouth on mine. She passed me that seed. Take it back and again. Till the covenant was gone. Then so was she. All but the memory. I had me one white son. Four good children. Grown up, gone, left, but never since. Nothing like that day come along. Now I got hope and maybe what all time's left. And this paper sack a sweet candy with one covenant for her somewhere waiting if I'm so blessed. He told me this story that day, again, every time since, twice a year, till the day he didn't come here. I never stopped remembering the promise I made to never have to say, I've got no more of my life to waste. I still try to look down every street, at every porch, every old walking man's face, every shadow place. Once mama say, don't you be shiftless boy. Don't you daydream your life away. Pretty soon you'll be walking lonesome Empty head and pocket like that crazy Uncle Abraham kicking rocks down the gravel road. I said, oh, mama, oh, mama, don't you even promise that might be so. It's a whole live world inside that lucky man. You and all the rest of this town don't even know one sweet covenant you can't never understand. Well, that was a seminal poem for me, a break away from the, uh, from the previous poems led me in another direction. Uh, and then another seminal moment, a uh, poem I want to read for Jan and for my daughter. I was working at the Writers at Work conference in Park City, Utah, two, and I'm going to use the term fairly loosely, gentlemen had been invited to the conference. Uh, they were put on a panel together, and it was like chocolate to water. Uh, they detested each other from the moment they saw each other. One of them, uh, I, I'm not going to call names, one of them had written a book, a book about the uh, riots in Detroit, and the other screamed at him from the stage. You had no right to that subject matter. You're not a black man. That's their subject matter. You have no right. And it, it got bad, so bad that I think for the only time in my life, I, I don't do this, I got up and walked out of the room. I'm Irish. I was ready to say, is this a private fighter? Can someone else join in? I was, I was at the threshold of losing it badly. It wasn't two minutes after I left the room that they, they had to break it off. And uh, the, the room emptied itself and they became gentlemen, of course. They took it out in the hall where people could watch and continued the fight. And then one of them said, what you've done is completely indefensible and stupid. It makes just about as much sense as if a man tried to write a poem in the voice of a woman. Now, what kind of an idiot would do something like that? Well, so I went home and uh, <clears throat> this is what emerged. I had some help 
coming up with this poem. My daughter, and the reason it's for her, was about somewhere between 14 and 16, and she had her first boyfriend. And oh, it was just something, Dad, you can't understand, but Mother, no, this is something real. And uh, I loved it as long as I could, decided, well, I need to, I need to do something here. And so I wrote this poem, Conversation Overheard from a Back Booth on a Tuesday. This is from the book, News from Down to the Cafe. Let's see, it's a 1999 book. So we've skipped some time for this one. But at that, at that time, I will say this, I was already pondering the idea of writing what became my book about women, Blue Bonnets, Fire Wheels, and Brown Eyed Susans, Women of Texas from 48 to 62, women who tremendously influenced my life. And I knew how to write them from the outside. It had never occurred to me to try to get inside and work my way out. And that moment between those two <clears throat> gentlemen and the writing of this poem gave me a whole new world. So I should also say, this one's also for Eleanor Wilner, my other hero and muse and role model. Conversation overheard from a back booth on a Tuesday. That man sitting beside you last night at the party, what a nice man he was. Oh, mama, mama, that man, he loves me. I think a lot. Yes, baby girl, surely I did know that. When I was a girl child once, and I was, when daddy worked at the mine, he brought all his possibles and responsibilities home on the porch for us not to touch on a weekend the good Lord made for pure pleasure. It was on a Friday, passing into a Saturday morning, after him being away all week a minor, making dream play in their room. All that house breathing love and a whole live grown up man walking in a part of my mind I didn't think my mama knew about either in the night. I had to go out on the porch alone with the memory image of him in the midnight. A giant storm throbbing all around and inside. So I had to sit down on daddy's box from the mine. I didn't find out until tomorrow it was dynamite for the blasting. It was a wonderful, terrible storm that summer night whole sky and house filled with fire and thunder from all the gods. My body drenched with rain and sweat until my nightgown held on to me like love itself. I sat alone with the shadows after that storm walked on. Breathing in all the rain wallowed hay and the yard and mama's roses opened and shed across the garden, glistening in the dreamlight. The whole live world exploded and then brought back together. By what happens to us all, baby girl, in a storm on a summer night. Well, that was a breakthrough poem. Here is a poem, A Horse of a Different Color. 
uh, when I retired, I took an early retirement. I wanted to make some transitions and I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to do, do some work for my home state. I had lived in Utah almost 40 years and uh, I turned back to where I, I, I actually began before I started writing the pig poems. I went back to landscape work. I did, a, I did a book called So Quietly the Earth and I followed it with a book entitled Stone, Wind, Water. And I pay homage to Bob Blessy here. He accepted that book for the Nevada Press and did just a beautiful job with that book. I, I, I quite love that book. I had originally intended this poem to be the key poem for, for, for this book and maybe the title poem. It's called Slot Canyon. Uh, it, it, it opens with an epigraph from Balzac. In the desert, there is all and there is nothing. God is there and man is not. Great smooth stanchions vault like a slow gesture across a corner of sleep. The mind's eye rises to the easy invitation by the memory of sky. Twisted slick rock tightens inward, gnarled roots tethered in sand. A moonflower huddles an eternal shadow against the nave wall. A blue collared lizard blinks, then closes its drowsy eyes beneath a white blossom. One seamless furrow, rock to sand, to leaf, to body, to white petal next, as if the desert turned itself inside out to contain this moment. I guess for me, that's sort of a theological poem. Where do I, where should I go now? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try one, see if I can get it done in time here. This is uh, from the most recent book that I published before this one. Uh, it was called uh, 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 Mining Tales. Uh, uh, for, I, I taught at the University of Nevada uh, Mine Tailings. I, I taught for the University of Nevada in 2016, and I lived in Silver City, Nevada. And I was adopted there of sorts, and it became sort of my surrogate hometown. And I wrote this poem while there. So I'm, I guess I'm reading this one for Silver City. And it's also written for my, my hero, my big brother, William Stafford. And I do scoop a line from Stafford in it. Uh, it's from his poem, Traveling Through the Dark. If you've read the poem, you will know exactly when I scoop him at the end. Globe Mallow Redux, House Rock Valley. And this one again is from a, a, a later poem. 2019 was the publication of this one. So this one's fairly new. Turn around right there, Jan said. I said, okay. Pulled off the highway, started taking pictures with her camera. Globe mallow spread thigh high across the red desert, thick as Moses' sea tangled with Pharaoh's chariots. Then another car pulled off, and another, then one more. All of us, like children, in a field of strawberries stretching to the horizon, lapping over into other worlds. 
And then the 84 Ford with Louisiana license plates. Doors flung open, driver bolting for a ditch and a long bleeding of the lizard, passenger sauntering toward us. Eyes agape, neck turning. What, what y'all looking for? Is it some dead bodies out here? Jan gestured toward the wildflowers, turned back to pleasure. He turned to me. What y'all taking them pictures of? I said, globe mallow. We've never seen such a profusion. Seen such of a what? The flowers, I said. What'd you say they was? Globe mallow. Like marshmallows? He said. I said, exactly. And they're in bloom like we've never seen before. Now, where marshmallows come from? And I too, Bill Stafford, thought hard for us all, my only swerving, and said, yes. They're in full bloom, and this fall they'll have fruit spread across this field like high cap rock, Texas cotton on a rain year. Is it worth any much, he said. I said, yes, yeah, so I've heard. Four ounce bag in a grocery store goes for two dollars, I've been told. And a toe sack, oh my, hold oh, what? 100 pounds at four $2 sacks to the pay. He said, Jesus Christ, can you pick it? And I said, well, well, on the outside of the fence, inside is reservation. Only the Navajo can harvest there. That's how they get all those new pickups. This side of the fence is BLM and belongs to the American public. You wouldn't be shitting me now. I said, no, sir, I am a retired professor of English and I have neither patience nor respect for hyperbolic felicity, that being beneath my dignity. He said, you swear to God? I said, yes, sir, I will swear to whatever God you believe in that that is exactly what I said. Jan was staring at me with her look. I shrugged in the sunlight, hoping I was bursting into blossom. Looks like it's going to be one hell of a crop this year, but he had already turned striding toward his car with purpose and enthusiasm. Lee Roy, he yelled, where you at? Get back to the car. I got me something to tell you. Hurry up, God damn it! Rip snorter for Bill and Dorothy Talmo. And I'm going to wrap out right now with another poem from my friend E.U. Washburn. E. Washburn was a grave digger and, and very much a mystic. He did not accept death. The death, dead are most surely living. And he believed he could communicate and could hear them. And he listened very carefully. This is a song E. U. Washburn heard while tending roses over the grave of Philemon and Bacchus Rojas. They died together on Easter Sunday buried in a single grave with roses from their yard that formed a bow over their tombstone. Those red roses. The epigraph is from one of my favorite lines in all of literature from Dante's Inferno, Canto 5, 103 to 105, Bacchus and Philemon. Uh, amor, chanulo, amato, amor, perdona. E presi del costui piacer se forte, che, come vera, ancor no, me abandona. My big sister, Eleanor Wilner, once wrote a poem 
about language. And when she said, English tries to say what it means. Italian tries to say it like it wants to be said. I've been asked to translate this on many occasions. My translation is pathetic. It's from that Canto Five where the lovers are uh, together in the whirlwind because they've been caught in an act of adultery. They were executed together and their punishment is to be linked in that whirlwind. And that's where Dante, the visitor in hell, faints and has to be carried to the next level of hell because he realizes right there, I worship a God I don't understand and do not agree with. These two people found love, and I have never found that in my life, and they are doomed to hell. Something is wrong here. The best Tex-Mex translation I can give you for what they just said is, love, which absolves no loved one from the act of loving, sees us so strongly that as thou the thou tense, thou seest, even now, even here in hell, it does not abandon us. The song E.U. Washburn heard while tending roses over the grave of Bacchus and Philemon Rojas. Is it true that love is God, she asked? And he said, Yes. Oh, yes. It is true, my love. But you must try and remember to never believe it that way. And then, do you believe, she asked. And he said, yes. I believe beyond death in believing. That faith one can never fully give up. There will always be doubt. You must also remember to hope. And that in our language, to wait and to hope are one. Espera, querida. Espera. And then what? should I hope for, she asked. And he said, with all your heart, you must hope that love will keep believing in you. Have faith in that alone, for only then will this world that we believe in continue to exist. And that is God. And that is enough. What a pleasure, my friends. Thank you again, Sean, Gail Marie. Thank you again, all of you. Thanks. What a terrific way to begin the journey of the last phase. Uh, I'm in love with this book. I hope you like it. Bless you for letting me be part of your lives. Adios. Dave, that was amazing. Um, I feel like I've been to church in all the good ways. Uh, I know the audience, wherever they are, were transported today. Um, you, you don't just read. You, you, you go to a spiritual place, and uh, all of the characters that you bring to life come into our lives. Uh, I'm now speaking for Gail Marie and all the good Sundance team and all of the good Samara team when I say that was that was a truly a blessing. So thank you all for tuning in this afternoon. It was, it was marvelous. I'm sorry I cut you off. Go ahead. No, you were very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you, brother. Yeah, absolutely you wonderful. Thank yeah. you, David. Thank you so much for being here. I feel lucky that it's part of my job that I got to sit here today and listen to you. So well, wonderful. You, you were my tutor 
Yeah, I mean, you didn't even know how to turn a computer on until you basically worked us through this. So I still don't know a damn thing, but at least I, I sure had a good teacher for a while. And I thank you for that. Bless well, you. I'm, I'm glad you. I did. Thank you so much. And thank you to Sean and to Gail Marie for that special intro. And please either come out to Sundance or if you have another air bookstore near you please pick up a copy of david's new book rusty barbed wire and we hope that you will join us again next week for the next intro uh or the next entry in our poetry month reading series and thank you all so much thank you bye y'all bye thank you everyone